Okay, so let's get started again. Um, so when we talk then about how people come to experience the divine or experience the supernatural, we have to kind of understand at the outset that we're talking about epistemologies that don't necessarily fit in a really nice way with um, laboratory-based science, right? I mean, there are exceptions, of course. Uh, there have been really interesting studies that show the positive psychological benefits of prayer or the positive psychological benefits of meditation by putting people in a lab and making them meditate. But for the most part, supernatural claims are not things that easily fit into a test tube. And indeed, the way in which people um, come to experience the divine is usually not something like that. It's often experienced through other kinds of epistemologies. And what I mean by epistemologies is a way of knowing truth, or at least a way of knowing what you think is the truth. Um, and so I would say that for religious epistemologies, these are often um, relational, by which I mean the epistemology is based on the idea that it, the, the, the way of gaining truth is not just sort of this Cartesian scientific idea of gleaning truth from sort of um, the cosmos by observation, but instead the idea that there's beings that you interact with that might be communicating truth to you, right? It's situated. It depends on the culture. Different cultures have very different ideas of who can or can't communicate with the divine. And then it's also um, messy, by which I mean um, for many cultures, for many religious people, there's a complex process by which you determine what is actually you having a supernatural experience and what is just sort of the chaos or randomness of life, right? Um, back to the Azande example from last time, when Azande, which craft is divined, uh, people often go to multiple diviners, which you wouldn't do if you thought the first one was 100% absolutely flawless and correct all the time. They do this in part to sort of like, let's make sure, right? Let's make sure that that wasn't just the termites acting weird on that stick, that it actually was the termites telling me that I've been afflicted. So I'll double check by going to the chicken oracle. Now, when we talk about um, religious epistemologies, I think that sometimes can cause some people um, a certain amount of concern and kind of the idea um, of kind of back to that Rajneesh Param example, right? People sort of conjure in their mind this idea of people blindly trusting an authority figure um, or maybe perhaps people um, not trusting science and therefore taking actions or taking stances which might be dangerous to others. Um, so recently the news story about um, the pastor who was still holding a large um, healing ceremony despite the shelter at home order related to the coronavirus. And so obviously people had a lot of criticism for that. Um, but the people that were going felt like, well, we have faith that he's going to heal us and keep us safe uh, through the power of God. So when we start talking about religious epistemologies or religious ways of knowing truth, I think these kind of more extreme examples are where people's minds sometimes go. But I'd like you to kind of recognize that those are the more extreme examples and start to think about the fact that religious people have all sorts of different epistemologies. Some of them, yes, are listening to authority figures. Some of them are practical forms of divination. Some of them are sacred texts, which have all sorts of different ways. Some of them are their own personal inner experiences, which if you think, well, that's highly subjective, I'd say, hey, welcome to being human, right? Um, I suspect that many people, when they decide who they're going to uh, marry or if they're going to get married, what job they're going to do, things of this nature. People often tell highly emotional, subjective stories about how they came to that conclusion of what was the right path for them. Most people don't say, yeah, you know, I did a randomized experiment with a hundred people to figure out who I was going to uh, marry. So a lot of human life is people relying on subjective experiences. So the fact that religious people sometimes use subjective experiences to determine truth is not really all that unusual compared to other parts of being a human being. Um, and there's other types of epistemologies that we rely on every day that aren't strictly speaking scientific. People rely on their bodily knowledge. Um, for example, people, you know, get a feeling in their gut that something's wrong with the situation or they feel goose pimples or something like that. People use their body to determine truths that can't be empirically known. Um, people use their quote unquote common sense, which really isn't scientific either. That's sort of people's hodgepodge of assumptions that their culture has given them mixed with their sort of basic crude logic. Uh, people use their oral traditions, right? Uh, people use kind of what they've been told. When somebody says like, oh, well, I've always been told that two heads are better than one. That's an oral tradition. That's not a scientific finding, right? It's not like somebody like scientifically tested whether two people think better than one person. Uh, you're trusting a saying that you've heard. 
that you've perhaps seen work in practice. So in all of these ways, we rely on epistemologies other than just sort of a scientific method. Um, most human beings do. And that doesn't mean that you're anti-scientific. Um, I, for example, uh, like most human beings use multiple of some of these different um, forms of epistemology. I certainly sometimes trust my gut or use common sense um, or have, you know, go to a religious text. But at the same time, I adore science. I revere science. Science is the reason that we're going to beat COVID. Uh, science is the reason that we know what's going on with COVID. Um, well, science is one reason we're going to beat COVID. There's a lot of other reasons we're going to beat COVID as well. Um, but my point with that is uh, science is the reason we were able to get a vaccine for polio and get people out of their deathbeds, essentially. So science is amazing. Um, recognizing that there are other kinds of epistemologies doesn't have to be an anti-scientific stance. Although it might be opposed to the idea of scientism. So I want to make a distinction right now between science and scientism. Um, science, by science I mean the scientific method and the scientific community employing the scientific method using experiment, and if experiment is not possible, then empirical observation to try to understand uh, the regularly observable processes of the cosmos, and then checking that against the research other people are doing. Science. Uh, Maybe you just thought of that meme with the guy with the crazy hair from the History Channel. But anyway, science. Um, by contrast, scientism is a term that we sometimes use in the social sciences to connote the ways in which belief in the scientific method can sometimes become almost a quasi-religion unto itself, where people trust anything that has the stamp of science, whether or not they have themselves um, have a good reason to or not, but they sort of trust anything that is even tangentially related to science as always 100% objectively true, which a lot of actual scientists would tell you, well, the whole point of science is that we're wrong a lot of the time and then get better over time. Um, so scientism, though, can be reflected in, for example, the way a lot of um, high school students think when you ask somebody that just is in high school, like, do you believe in evolution? And they make the statement, yeah, I believe in evolution. Um, well, first of all, you shouldn't be saying, I believe in evolution. It's a scientific theory. You should say, I either find the evidence compelling or I don't. Um, furthermore, to say, I believe in evolution, um, a lot of times what people, maybe high scores is too strong, maybe like middle scores or grade scores, a lot of times people at that stage of their life, they haven't like looked at the data, right? They're not ready to process the data. They're not there yet with their understanding. Um, they're not like sort of examining skeletons or even pictures of skeletons necessarily. They're trusting things their teachers and parents have told them. And that's fine. That's part of how human beings teach culture to each other. And that's, you know, reflects the fact that a 12 year old's not ready for what a 25 year old is in terms of science typically. But my point with that is that science can sometimes become quasi religious when people invest it with so much authority um, that we trust it implicitly so long as somebody says this is what science says. And that might not seem like a very destructive thing. The example I just shared is a benign example. We can think of more destructive examples. In the late 1800s, um, people were often using science overtly to justify racism and sort of, oh, well, science says that this race is inferior to this race because that's what certain scientists were saying. Now, was their scientific method any good? No, it was garbage based on a bunch of assumptions of their culture. But because there was, quote unquote, scientific authority figures saying it, people implicitly trusted it and used it to justify the prejudice that they were already leaning towards. So we want to make a distinction then between science and scientism. And I think in recognizing alternative epistemologies, we're not making an anti-scientific claim, but we might be making an anti-scientism claim in the sense that we're saying that um, getting a truth from a scientist is not the only possible way of telling truth. All right, well, moving right along. Um, I want to talk then now about some of the ways, some of the epistemologies on a more practical level. How do people try to communicate with the supernatural? Um, I have here a sign where it jokingly says, "Did you you did ask for a sign and then it's attributed to God. Obviously, God doesn't typically speak in billboards. Well, maybe God does. I guess that's a matter of opinion. Um, but that's typically not what we mean by communicating with the divine. I also have here a picture of a horoscope, uh, or rather the symbols from a kind of classic horoscope that you'd see perhaps in a newspaper or online. Um, and, you know, many, many people across the world use astrology as a form of discovering truth from the supernatural or discovering what is perceived to be truth from supernatural. Um, and in 
one question I want you to ask yourself is why do people do that? Why do people try to understand the supernatural? Why, back to our reading about neo-pagans, why do reclaiming practitioners um, want to try to find a more mystical, deeper sense to the universe and use ceremonies to do that? Um, as the reading suggested, many of them are highly literate in science. Why do they then want to additionally go beyond that and try to find truth from the divine? And I think we could say that there's a million questions to that. Um, people want to transcend, right? People want to feel like they can find a deeper level of knowledge that will bring them more peace and happiness. Uh, people want to gain practical wisdom um, about their situations. People want to uh, figure out why they're sick and they're consulting a shaman. People want to figure out where the best place to um, bury their departed parent is. And so they turn to geomancy or to... Uh, Yi Jing based divination in certain parts of rural China. People want to feel like, am I on sort of the right spiritual path? So there's all sorts of reasons somebody might be trying to gain knowledge from the supernatural. Um, and then you might also ask sort of how do people communicate with the supernatural then? And the answer is the ways that people try to communicate with the supernatural are incredibly varied across cultures and even across individuals. Um, and Although there is tremendous, ridiculous amount of diversity in these different epistemologies and these ways of gaining truth, we're going to talk about the fact that there are some patterns, right? There are some things that pop up in culture after culture, and we'll talk about a few of those patterns in this lecture. Things like shamanism, and we'll talk about what I, we mean by that. Things like prophets, which pop up in some cultures. Things like priests or formal clergy. Things like divination, which we'll talk about. Uh, things like prayer, which is, if not a cultural universal, certainly exceptionally widespread. Uh, things like mysticism, which we'll talk a bit about, most likely. Things like sacred texts, things like oral traditions. So there's lots of different ways people try to get at sort of getting truth from the supernatural.